Thank you, everyone, and good morning. It's a pleasure to be back with the ACSS colleagues, old and new. So welcome, and welcome to all of you. So this morning, I'd like to try and do five things. Uh, that might seem like a lot, but I promise uh, not to go on too long. The first is to talk about a national security strategy and what that is. The second would be to talk about and elaborate on what Assis just talked about, rationales for a national security strategy and reasons why a country might want a national security strategy written down. And then third, talk about some reasons why a country may not want a national security strategy, uh, particularly not one written down. Uh, and then uh, discuss, as time allows, the means of national security strategy, the resources uh, that we were, were just briefly introduced to. And then leave, fifth, leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Okay, so what is national security strategy? So what we teach at the National War College for national security strategy is a strategy that's whole of government, not a military strategy, whole of government, at the highest level, something that the head of state signs and promulgates that looks at context, international context, regional context, domestic context, determines what's in a nation's best interests, then sets objectives to advance those interests or to protect them, and then finds creative ways to use the means at the disposal of the nation, or if the means aren't available, to generate the means, to generate the resources, to be able to implement the strategy at a later date. A national security strategy process includes weighing the costs and risks of a selected course of action and continually scanning the environment for changes in the environment that might disrupt your strategy. There's lots of variations on this definition, but it's an ends, ways, and means structure that is widely accepted in the national security community, although lots of people put different uh, applications or modifications to it. So we're not talking about a military strategy. We're not talking about an economic development strategy. We're talking about, not talking about a negotiation strategy. Uh, we're not talking about environmental strategy. We're talking about a strategy that takes all of that into account somehow. We talk about inward-facing strategies and outward-facing strategies to get to this point about resourcing. So an outward-facing strategy might be something that looks from your country out to its neighbors or the international environment. And an inward-facing strategy is focused on your own country and what's happening domestically and frequently on the ability to generate resources to support that outward-facing strategy. Sometimes we call them means-producing strategies resource producing strategies, and sometimes we call them means expending or consuming strategies. So as he said, every strategy must have implementation in mind at some point. And this is, uh, a, a, these are a few ways to think about it. Okay, so rationale for strategies. Uh, so we've already heard some, some points about uh, to affect change, a break with the past. Yes, agree with those, but I'd like to elaborate on a few. Uh, could be a change in the international environment could be a change in the regional environment, could be a change in the domestic environment, could be a change in the individual leader. These are all those, those environmental changes. But there are some other rationales. A nation might want to produce a strategy to provide a shared vision of the future, to provide unity of effort for a nation, uh, and also to prioritize, prioritize effort, to prioritize resources. Uh, you might, a nation might want a strategy uh, to prevent another nation from achieving their goals and objectives. You might want to keep a good thing going. You might want to keep a regime in place. You might want to give hope or confidence or send a message with your strategy. 
you might want to have a strategy to gain those resources I mentioned about, I mentioned, or to allocate resources, or to manage risk, or to gain entry into a system, or to modify a system, or to tear down a system. So I can think of examples, uh, maybe in the Q&A we can talk about some examples of all those strategies, um, or it might be a combination, and I'm always looking for good examples, so hopefully in the Q&A you can uh, give me some examples of, of those. Um, next, quickly, why um, might a nation not want a strategy? Well, secrecy, you may not want to tell the opponent what you're doing. You don't want to give them the playbook. Uh, it makes it easier to defend against, perhaps. Um, you might want to keep competitors, not necessarily enemies, but you might want to keep competitors at a disadvantage. So you may not want a strategy. If you've got one in your mind, you may not want it written down. Um, you may not want a strategy because it, it could constrain you. If you tell everyone, this is what I'm going to do, then you kind of have to do it or you lose credibility as the senior strategist. Having a strategy written down might also forego opportunities uh, that Assis was talking about. Um, you might not want a strategy in case public opinion didn't support your strategy, or in case it violates international law, or it's unsuccessful then you can never be accused of not having uh, succeeded in your strategy. And you may uh, not want a strategy because it allows you to, as a leader, to uh, have a, a force of your personality, the cult of your personality. It puts you in charge in a very uh, uh, evident way that makes you, as the leader, in charge and as the decision maker. So just a few reasons why you may not want a strategy. So now just a few words on means or resources. Now we talk about means in, in basically three ways. We talk about means in terms of institutions, in terms of people, and in terms of things. And I like to refer to them as things you can touch, tangible, tangible things. So we have an acronym called DIME, D-I-M-E. Have many of you hopefully have heard of it. Uh, it stands for diplomacy, information, military, and economic. We call these the instruments of power. So on the diplomatic side, of course, we have Ministry of Foreign Affairs, either our State Department, traditional institutions. There's also international organizations like the United Nations, regional organizations like the African Union, sub-regional organizations like the regional economic communities, ECOWAS or SADC or uh, for all the sub-regions. So institutions. But there's also ambassadors and special envoys and and unexpected people like Bono can be a diplomat. Treaties and agreements and communiques, resolutions, conference summits, cables, note verbal, demarches, these are all diplomatic tools. These are all diplomatic means that can be wielded in different ways. We also, so D, that's the first one, D. On the I for information, we think of Ministries of Information, some of us have those in our countries. Uh, the United States used to have a US uh, information agency, no longer. But there's also universities and think tanks that promulgate information. The intelligence communities deal in uh, information. And in people, there's spokespersons and reporters and analysts. And in terms of things, there's newspapers and televisions and radio broadcasts and iPhones, and parenthetically, I, I just read a fascinating uh, report that we still call this a phone, but did you know that, that people, the sixth most used purpose of this is talking on the phone? The, the number one use is for texting. Number two is a camera. Three, we use it to play mu music. We use it for a map, and we use it to get on the internet and maybe shop. But, but we still call it a phone. So it's a means. 
tweets, satellites, intelligence, ideas, symbols, logos. We have the Africa Center logo. These are all uh, uh, informational means. Some of these symbols are quite benign and positive, but there's also symbols you can probably think of that evoke negative and very powerful images and passions. On the military side, similarly, we have ministries of defense and ministries of interior. We have institutions. Uh, similarly, we have uh, regional organizations and, uh, that manage military. We have planes and ships and tanks and troops and commanders, generals and admirals. We have police. Happy to see police in the audience today law enforcement, paramilitary, but also things like radios and batteries and clothes. And think about clothes can be, many of these things can be used in multiple ways. So when we talk about means, we teach means are, are value neutral. They're just things. What you do with them, how you put them in motion, whether you give them or you take them away, are important in your strategy development process. On the economic side, of course, again, we have government ministries, but we have the World Bank, and we have the African Development Bank, and again, the regional economic communities, and money, and grants, and loans, scholarships, aid in terms of wheat or corn or vaccines. We have stock markets, exchanges, cooperatives, sanctions. So again, economic means. So there's lots of things, lots of means, lots of resources at a country's disposal. The art form is how you assemble them over time to achieve those objectives that you set out for yourself. So just about done. Um, Assis talked about different types of security in the contemporary uh, African environment. Absolutely right, couldn't agree more. Traditional state security is, is one model of security. Human security is another. Environmental security is another. Regime security another. All very uh, valid uh, points and a strategy that is a national security strategy should incorporate and accommodate all those perspectives. I'll just think I'll, I'll, I'll end there with one note that was made earlier uh, about who does uh, uh, servant leadership? Who does this? Who's responsible for strategy development? Uh, well, everyone is, ideally. Um, it's also a reflection, some of the problems that he's was talking about, a reflection of democracy and increased democratization in strategy development. Some of those accountability issues that we were talking about, you don't have those in dictatorships. So there's a strategy process and a democracy that looks a bit different than it might in a country that has a strong leader or a dictatorship. But one of the models for positive strategy development we talk about is servant leadership. It's building consensus, knowing the nation you serve, knowing the interests that your nation is trying to accomplish, and putting your own interests beneath that of the nation. So with that, I think I'd like to conclude and leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Thank you very much.